Hello and welcome to part two of our lecture on the innate immune system. We're going to be talking about first line defenses or physical barriers. We will also include in our first line defenses some chemical barriers. So the physical barriers um, include the skin and mucous membranes and the skin consists of both the dermal and epidermal layer and it contains a lot of keratin. This makes it fairly water resistant. One of the defense mechanisms of the actual skin itself in the epidermis is our epidermal cells slough off or kind of fall off. We shed millions of skin cells every day and many bacteria that cause disease that are considered pathogens, we refer to as transient bacteria, are on the surface of our skin. And when we slough off those uh, dead skin cells, attached to those skin cells are those pathogens that we may run into. Now in the mucous membranes, we have a lot more activity and defense. Uh, mucous membranes are considered the uh, most common portal of entry for pathogens. That would be how, those, how pathogens get into our system. We have mucous membranes that line our gastrointestinal tract, the urogenital tract, the respiratory tract, um, our eyes and mouth. Uh, mucus itself has what's known as a lavaging action, which is just simply washing away or washing out. Some of our mucosal cells, the uh, endothelial cells that line the mucos, uh, mucosal membranes, you can see these membrane cells are what we refer to as ciliated cells. They do not have true cilia, just the um, edges of the cells here are enfolded um, as if they have uh, cilia. Antimicrobial compounds are found within uh, the, the fluids within the mucus itself. Also, mucus houses a class of antibodies known as IgA antibodies. Uh, most cells, like in the respiratory tract, we see in the bronchial tubes what's known as the ciliary escalator. Uh, the ciliary, ciliary escalator uh, is used to push things back up <clears throat> so you can clear your throat. Uh, the mucus itself will trap microorganisms, slow them down so they, if they're motile, so they can't move around as quickly. This will uh, enhance phagocytosis by allowing phagocytic cells to be able to catch up to them. Microorganisms that are motile are much, much smaller than our phagocytic cells and much faster. Also, within our uh, GI tract, specifically in our gastrointestinal tract, uh, also in the urogenital and parts of the respiratory, we have tissue called malt tissue. This um, malt stands for mucosal associated lymphatic tissue. And it is located for the most part in the GI tract. In anatomy uh, two, you may have been asked to identify Peyer's patches. Peyer's patches are part of the malt system, and this is considered a third branch of the immune system. These are small areas um, uh, underneath the endothelial lining of the gastrointestinal lumen. They are attached to short uh, kind of narrow cells called M cells, M standing for microfold. These M cells are really important in allowing bacteria and other pathogens or microorganisms to enter into the Peyer's patch. Inside of the Peyer's patch are specially designated macrophages and dendritic cells. These cells are basically sampling what's going on in the gastrointestinal tract all the time. They will phagocytize those bacteria and sample them to ensure that it is all normal gut flora and there are no pathogens present. So kind of this third type of immune system known as um, malt tissue is important uh, in immunity. Now some chemical defenses found in the mucous membranes include antimicrobial secretions. We have secretions, uh, and of course the mucus itself is fluid and so cells will secrete these antimicrobial compounds as a form of defense. This includes lysozymes, peroxidases, uh, lactoferrin, and antimicrobial peptides. Oh, my little parentheses is missing there. Uh, lysozymes are responsible for the breakdown of peptidoglycan. They are going to be most effective, if you think about it, right, the structure of bacteria, they will be most effective against gram positives. Now, gram positive organisms tend to be found more often on our skin and on the exterior of the body. They can withstand high salt concentrations and very dry um, uh, environments. 
So if we have mucosal membranes near the surface of our drier skin, they're going to come into contact with more gram-positive organisms. Peroxidases break down hydrogen peroxide, and um, hydrogen peroxide is a byproduct of cellular respiration. It's an, a um, toxic waste product known as a reactive oxygen species, and hydrogen peroxide will be broken down into a water molecule and an oxygen gas molecule. So organisms that are disrupted or interrupted by the presence of O2, that uh, organisms that may be uh, facultative or obligate anaerobes, Right? So anaerobic organisms will be disrupted by the uh, uh, presence of oxygen, of O2. Lactoferrin is a very specific compound <clears throat> used to bind iron. Microorganisms, bacteria in particular, need high concentrations of iron during binary fission. So if our, um, we have a lot of free iron floating around in our blood. So if lactoferrin is released, it will bind to that iron, making it impossible for microorganisms to grab it. Microorganisms produce iron-grabbing proteins called siderophores. And these siderophores are kind of attached to the outside of the microorganism like little um, antennas for iron. And they will latch onto iron bringing it to the microorganism for absorption. So lactoferrin is, an, is a protein our bodies produce in order to cover up that iron and hide it so that the siderophores of microorganisms cannot grab it. Finally, the antimicrobial peptides, these are incredibly small proteins. They are anywhere from 10 to 15 amino acids in length. That's incredibly small. And these little tiny amino acids will attach to the surface of microorganisms and begin kind of drilling holes through the extracellular membrane or through the peptidyl glycan. This will cause some form of microbial damage. An example of this are um, a class of uh, antimicrobial peptides called defensins. And these are produced by E. coli and a few other gram-negative organisms. And these defensins will, will drill holes into the cell walls or through the peptidoglycan or extracellular layer to cause the cellular contents to leak out. We just looked at our uh, metabolism chapter and think about it in the metabolism chapter. If we look at a gram-negative cell, we would have that inner uh, membrane, the actual true cell membrane. There's that really thin cell wall and then we have the outer uh, lipid layer that is uh, on those gram negatives. And if these defensins drill little holes, remember the proton motive force is within this membrane here. And if we drill these little holes in here, all of those hydrogen ions are going to, or protons, are going to leak out. And if all of the protons leak out, then the cell will not have a proton motive force in order to uh, make ATP. So these defensins, will cause leakage of the protons so that the proton motive force and ATP production will cease and the cell will die. Now, normal bright microbiota also have a, um, have a defensive effect for us. It is in their best interest to make sure that our cells are well protected and that our body is well protected. So these are sometimes referred to as our symbiotic bacteria. We do have a couple of different types of relationships with our normal flora. Uh, and but all of them are symbiotic relationships and normal flora are bacteria that are a permanent resident in our body. We have normal flora in our gastrointestinal tract on our skin, um, in our mouths, ears, uh, nose, respiratory tract, anywhere that's pretty much exposed to the outside world. Uh, these uh, symbionts can be competitive with the transients. They produce toxins against other bacteria. They can do things like break down lipids to produce fatty acids to change pH. E. coli produces a class of um, toxins called colicins. These are um, produced in the colon and they are toxic to other non-colon non, um, uh, uh, non bearing bacteria. They can produce acids to alter the pH and make an environment extremely uh, acidic. Some organisms can survive in those environments and others cannot. If we lose balance in our normal microbiota, particularly in the gastrointestinal system, we can really start to see uh, the effects of that. One of them is a super infection known as a C. diff 
Um, C. difficile is an antibiotic disruption. If somebody is on a broad spectrum antibiotic, they may take um, that antibiotic for an extended period of time because it's broad spectrum, it will destroy the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. However, we do have a class of bacteria that is normal flora for most people. It is called Clostridium difficile. And Clostridium difficile forms endospores. So if this um, bacteria is in our gastrointestinal tract, E. coli and other organisms, microorganisms that are producing these toxins will cause C. diff to, or clostridium to form endospores and it will remain in the gastrointestinal tract but in its endospore form. And if you remember from unit one, endospores are metabolically inert. So they are not uh, Purdue, they're inactive metabolically or minimum metabolism. So these cells are, are surviving in their endospore form, but they're not producing any kinds of toxins. Now, if someone takes a lot of antibiotics, all of their normal flora die off. So then these toxins here are no longer being produced and C. difficile can now germinate out of its endospore form into its vegetative form. In its vegetative form, it is highly metabolically active and it is producing a lot of toxins. There's a C1 and a C2 toxin that these guys produce. And both of these toxins, I think they call them type A, type B now, uh, both of these toxins can cause severe uh, gastrointestinal upset, diarrhea, um, even ulcerative colitis. Another example of a um, antibiotic disruption would be candidus, which is your normal vaginal yeast infection. The lactobacillus that lines, uh, that's part of the vaginal flora, keeps things very acidic, and the acids prevent the spreading of candidus yeast, uh, which like things a little more alkaline in order to be what we call dimorphic, where they change their uh, morphology or shape. So as long as the environment is, it remains acidic, then the yeast uh, will do what it's supposed to do. It is part of our normal flora. But if we take a bunch of antibiotics and the, the vaginal flora dies off, the uh, uh, lactobacillus that keeps things acidic dies off and the vaginal lining becomes too alkaline, then the candidus yeast can take over and become what we call dimorphic and cause the vaginal yeast infection. Another function of our normal mi microbiota is to help train our immune system over time. Uh, Crohn's disease, excuse the misspelling here, uh, Crohn's disease is thought to be, one of the causes of Crohn's disease is thought to be an intolerance to our normal gut bacteria. And so here on the right, I have um, an IBD diagnosis, inflammatory bowel disease, which is another, um, it's, this is late stage Crohn's. Now, there is believed to be some genetic predisposition of it, um, and of course, environmental factors can play a very big role in any kind of um, gastrointestinal infection. But when the disease begins, the epithelial barrier starts to break down a little bit, and these microorganisms start gaining entry, and we don't really have any uh, tolerance to it. We would normally have tolerance to it, but now we don't. Uh, and so this is dysbiosis. Once this begins to spread and we start to see expansion of it, we start to see inflammation. So this lack of tolerance to our normal microbiota, now our normal microbiota, instead of just being, being part of the mucosal membrane and, and riding around in the mucus, they're now causing inflammatory reactions. And this excessive inflammation over time can eventually result in an uncontrollable um, immune response eventually bowel damage, and this is known as inflammatory bowel disease, which is late stage Crohn's. So these are just some review questions that you can go over to just review what we talked about in our um, uh, uh, chemical and physical barriers, what are the important physical barriers, how your skin protects you, three ways that mucous membranes protect you, chemical defenses, um, three ways your normal flora can help protect you, and how are your normal microbiota and the development of Crohn's disease related. So I hope you enjoyed our lecture on physical and chemical barriers in the innate immune system. I will see you in part three.